Okay, hello. Um, thank you for coming uh, virtually. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm gonna, gonna start talking about the Declaration of Independence unless there's any questions about anything before I start. Okay, so um, so as everyone knows, the Declaration of Independence was written in 1776 <laughs> um, by Thomas Jefferson. I'm not going to do this for all the people we're reading today because there's too many, but I guess I will write up Thomas Jefferson's dates here. Uh, 1743 to 1826. So remember, Jonathan Edwards died in 1758. So uh, uh, Jefferson and Edwards were actually contemporaries, although uh, I guess Jefferson was pretty, pretty young when Jonathan Edwards died. Um, so we haven't moved actually that far forward in time. Um, but obviously big things have happened. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of things one could say about Thomas Jefferson, uh, both good and bad and indifferent, I guess. Um, but uh, again, I, I obviously don't have time to talk about that. Um, um, and as far as the other authors that were in this reading, I'm just going to go briefly who, who, through who they are and what they're doing. So they're obviously, I mean, I hope this was obvious, the main reading, so to speak, is the Declaration of Independence, but then we have various people uh, responding to it in some way. So the first one is Jeremy Bentham. And at the time he wrote this, he was not yet famous as the founder of utilitarianism, but uh, that's, he became famous as the founder of utilitarianism not long after. Um, and uh, this piece, which is, was published anonymously um, as a chapter in an anonymous book by someone else, <laughs> um, is it really a sustained philosophical attack on the Declaration of Independence? Um, then we have a couple people, Benjamin Banneker. So Benjamin Banneker was a um, free black scientist and surveyor, um, largely self-taught. Uh, because he largely had to self-teach. <laughs> um, and uh, William, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. I guess I should write these people up here, if nothing else. Sometimes he spelled it with one S. I think early in his life, he spelled it with one S and then later he added another S. I read somewhere that the, the, this surname is still common among Pequots today and that uh, um, whether it's spelled with one S or two S, it's still pronounced as one syllable. Unfortunately, it didn't say what the one syllable is. <laughs> So I don't know if it's pronounced apes or apps or I'm not sure. Anyway, I'll call him William Apes, I guess. I don't have to talk about him that much or I won't get to talk about him that much. But he was a, a member of the Pequot Indian tribe and uh, was who became a minister and a writer and a orator as well. Um, so... Uh, these two people are basically like taking things that it says in the Declaration of Independence or in Ape's case, he says the Constitution, but he means the Declaration of Independence, I believe. Um, 
and um, applying it against the American institutions that it created. Right, like in one case, Banneker is using it to sort of speak request admission to those institutions, um, saying we're also created equal. So what about us, right? Um, whereas, um, and this 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 contrast is interesting because it because it gets to the tension I'm talking about in the document itself. That Apes takes the same thing and says uses it to request getting out of these institutions, basically. Right? He's saying like we also have a right to be independent. <laughs> um. Okay, anyway, that's those two. As I said, I'm just going to go through these people quickly. There is something else. Oh no, I already mentioned both. Okay. Um, so All these people are interesting and worth knowing more about. And you know, if you want, you can look them up yourself. But this is, I won't have time to say much about any of them. So Harriet Martin, who was an English writer, um, a feminist, as you can tell from the selection, um, and also considered to be one of the founders of the discipline of sociology. Um, W.E. Du Bois, who we're going to read later, is also sometimes considered to be one of the founders of the discipline of sociology. I guess it took a long time to found. Anyway, um, uh, she wrote this book, uh, Society in America, based on her travels around, around America in 1834 and 1835. Um, and Margaret Fuller. was uh, a transcendentalist thinker and associate of Emerson and Thoreau. I mentioned her before. Um, she was, uh, um, among other things, I guess, well, I guess maybe her most famous work is a book called Woman in the 19th Century. So as you can tell from the title, it's a, it's a kind of feminist uh, book and a relatively early feminist book, although not the first by any means. Um, and uh, in this piece, which was part of a series she published for the New York, in the New York Daily Tribune, she had like a column there. This was on the occasion of the 4th of July, this was her column. Um, uh, and uh, I believe, She's upset, especially because of the annexation of Texas. Um, it hadn't actually been annexed in July of uh, whatever year this was. I didn't write that down here. 1840 something. I don't know. Anyway, Texas hadn't actually been annexed yet, but Polk had won the election and it was like the writing was on the wall. So Texas was going to be admitted as a slave state. Um, that was the issue here. Uh, um, and also she's worried about the what's on the horizon now, again, now that Polk has been elected, namely the Mexican-American War. Um, OK, and, and these two people, so like I said, Bentham is in attack. These two people are using it against the American institutions. These two, it's more complicated. <laughs> um, okay, are there questions about any of those people or anything before I, I go on? Um, I'm not sure I can explain why I decided to do this reading this way. I mean, just reading the Declaration of Independence would not have been enough. Not just because it's so short, but I mean, because it's so short and so familiar that it like could be hard to get yourself to actually read it. <laughs> I thought so. Um, uh, it seemed like the right place to to like comment on. 
how actually interesting and in some ways difficult the text it is by showing all these people reacting to it. Um, Okay, so, but I'm going to start by talking about the declaration itself, and then uh, I think a lot of what I say is going to be based on Bentham's attacks, but then as other people, like, come in and have something to say, I'll mention them. Um, so, um, So the issue that I've been talking about, about the legitimacy of particular government comes up immediately in the first sentence of the Declaration of Independence. Um, I think I even mentioned that before, but now let me, um, no. yes. Right, so it says, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which co have connected them with another. Um, and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. That's not even the whole sentence, right? That's just like when blah, 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 then, but I'm going to talk about that part. So, um, what's uh, being claimed is not equality and independence, that is separateness, right? The separate and equal station. Separate and equal station is the independence and the equality. So, but what's being claimed is not independence or equality for individuals. That doesn't get mentioned until the next paragraph, <laughs> right? What's being claimed is independence and equality for peoples. We, I mean, I underlined people, oops. This is not a good system. Uh, okay, there it is, sorry. Um, right, for one people, dot, 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 to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station with the laws of, laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. Right, so it's peoples are entitled to equality and independence. Um, and yet the claim is made, right? So the, the claim is for, uh, the claim is for the independence of a people, but it's made by appeal to a universal law. namely the law of nature or the divine law. Um, um, right, so presumably Jefferson, like Locke, um, and I guess everyone has heard about how the founders of the United States were like influenced by Locke. So that's definitely true. <laughs> um, and Jefferson is, in most of what he says here, is following Locke. Um, so like for Jefferson, like Locke, these two are the same thing. The law of nature is the divine law. Another thing it can be called is the law of reason.
because what God, quote unquote, commands are just the universal principles that anyone um, with sufficient patience could figure out for themselves by using their reason. That's Locke's position and also Jefferson's position. So, right, so even though Bentham kind of makes fun of this um, and says, wait, what's the difference between the law of nature and nature is God? But I think for Jefferson, it's evident that these are the same thing. Um, and, and this, I think, is also what he means when he says in the, in the following paragraph that certain principles are self-evident. What it means is again that you that, that these principles belong to the universal law or the law of reason. That is that you can um, that anyone in principle can derive them, can convince themselves that they're true, prove them to themselves using their reason. Um, I mean, I say that because it's I think it's clear that self-evident here can't mean like. Um, obvious at first glance or something like that, right? Because these principles are not obvious at first glance, yeah. that all men are created equal, et cetera. But I think they're self-evident in the sense that um, the opposite of a law, a law of nature, uh, uh, the law of reason would be um, um, like especially revealed divine law, something where God had to tell you. Um, Jefferson, I think for sure doesn't believe in that. And Locke probably doesn't believe in it. <laughs> um, but in any case, if there were such a thing, that would be the opposite of self-evident. That would be evident only on someone else's authority. Okay, so um, um, so this is going to be a problem. Um, but it's also, as Martin New points out, um, is like um, somehow one of the most important results of the American Revolution um, so find this in Martin do Um, so Mr. Madison remarked to me, right, she was like, so she was like already a well-known author and kind of important person when she took this trip through the United States. So when she came here, she got to meet all the important people. Uh, Jefferson was already dead, but uh, she met Madison, right? So Mr. Madison remarked to me that the United States had been, quote, useful in proving things before held impossible. I guess he means proving possible things before held impossible. And, uh, and she says, well, he mentioned certain things, but here's one that occurs to me. The pursuit of the a priori method in forming a constitution. The a priori method, as it is styled by its enemies, um, though its advocates with more reason call it the inductive method. Um, So, right, what she's what she means by the a priori method in establishing a constitution is that um, rather than take an existing constitution, which has been tried by time, you know, and try to preserve it and perhaps fix it in certain ways, 
which of course is what we now do now in the United States, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, but back then what they did rather than doing that was to um, start with certain principles and try to figure out what constitution you should write based on those principles. And you might think that that would be unlikely to succeed. Um, and a lot of people did think that, that that would be unlikely to succeed. Because, you know, uh, um, we're not capable of constructing such a complicated thing from scratch. It has to arise by natural evolution. Um, you might think that, but Martin New is saying, hey, but look, uh, the United States was founded on principles by the a priori method. And, you know, so when she says that she's talking about the Constitution, but she makes it clear that she thinks the principles, the quote unquote great principles that the Constitution was written based on are the principles contained in the Declaration. Um, Right, so um, she's saying the United States was founded on these principles that Jefferson lists here. Um, and what do you know, it worked. <laughs> I mean, in 1834, it wasn't clear, clear quite how well it worked. Um, it was already plenty clear quite how badly it worked, <laughs> which she has plenty to say about. Um, but it wasn't uh, clear yet quite how stable this constitution was. Um, you know, I mean, we've had one civil war uh, and that was 150 years ago. And like, I don't think the Roman empire had 50 years without that. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's in a way it's astonishing, you know, uh, it seems like a pretty good uh, advertisement for the a priori method. But um, but to make that case, you have to understand how an appeal to a universal principle can give rise to this. And you have to start with the first paragraph where the universal principle is supposed to underwrite the independence of the new nation. And there, I think, coming back to Bentham, kind of making fun of this, calling it the law of nature and of nature's God. Um, so uh, Bentham, who's an atheist, by the way, I mean, Jefferson maybe is an atheist too, I don't know, but Bentham definitely is. So, um, but uh, I think you can, you can think of Bentham's point this way. Um, the kind of divine law that could refer to a specific people wouldn't be natural law. It would have to be revealed law. And this, of course, is what like certain peoples who claim to have been chosen by God or whatever, <laughs> this is what they say, right? They don't say, um, as we don't say, I, I want to necessarily get into how I would understand this. But anyway, I, like we don't say, we deduce from first principles that God chose us. <laughs> we say, you know, uh, there was a voice that came down from the mountain and said, be my people. Right? <laughs> it's that kind of divine law. So Bentham, so like when Bentham says, well, yeah, I mean, if uh, God has revealed something about your, 
uh, right to independence, just uh, produce the proof and we'll be happy to let you go. He's, you know, I think he's like, on the one hand, he's deliberately misunderstanding what Jefferson is saying. But on the other hand, he's like basically within his rights because it seems like what Jefferson is saying won't stand up on the right interpretation. Um, Jefferson would have to mean that God specifically said he wanted to, America to be independent. Whereas in contrast, divine law, qua, or divine law qua natural, right? The law of reason um, speaks to all individuals as citizens of the, the kingdom of God, the universal kingdom of God, right? It doesn't speak to peoples. Um, and in fact, going back to Martin New, um, oops. So this, by the way, this is page three of Martin News pages. Um, I wrote here 28, but I'm not sure what I'm counting from. So I'm not sure if that's useful to you, but, um, um she says uh where is this oh here we go um and this could actually be read as a as a response to bentham i mean it might actually be intended as a response to bentham no doubt she read this um, but one way or the other, it could be taken as a response to, to Bentham because she's trying to say what the divine law is that uh, is behind, that, that's being appealed to here. And she suggests that it's the golden rule, right? Do unto others as ye would that they, do, that they should do unto you. Perhaps it may re be reserved for their country to prove yet one more impossible thing, that men can live by the rule which their maker has given them to live by. Right? So she's saying, uh, what is the law of nature is God that's involved here? Um, it's the golden rule. Well, I mean, okay, so I guess it is revealed in the sense that Jesus teaches it, but it's presumably supposed to be a rule that you could arrive at on your own without hearing it from Jesus, do unto others. Um, 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 I mean, I'm actually not sure whether Bentham would even accept that rule in any straightforward sense. Uh, um, but in any case, if you do accept that rule, you accept it as a universal law that anyone could derive. And, you know, um, that's exactly what Martin New concludes here after this discussion. She concludes politics are morals all the world over. That is, politics universally implicate the duty and happiness of man. Every branch's mor morals is and ought to be considered a universal concern. Meaning, like, it's, uh, um, What happens in politics is uh, like uh, important because it reflects everyone's individual responsibilities. Right, so that is again, the, um, as we saw before, universality and individuality go together. 
um, because this is not a concern of a particular group of people, of a particular class, um, a particular race. Um, it's, uh, it's a universal concern of all people. Therefore, it's like pertains to everyone as their own individual universe uh, uh, responsibility. And so it's going to be found in rules like the golden rule that um, I guess I should say everyone can figure it out for themselves and it speaks to every individual. So like, for example, if you, the government has made a law um, and you're trying to decide whether to follow the law, the rule says, think whether in following this law you're doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. If the answer is yes, follow the law. If the answer is no, don't follow the law. It speaks to you as an individual. Um, and so, like, the question is, I'm not sure if I'm beating this question, this problem into the book, like into the ground by emphasizing it over and over. But I mean, I think it helps to see it concretely reflected in what each of these people are saying here. So, like, um, so, uh, you know, Martin New is is saying this is great because this new nation is being founded on principles. But the very way that she understands what universal principles are seems to tell against using them to, to uh, support the independence of a government, of a, of a people, of a nation, right? It's the independence of individuals that this will support. And, um, Um, here's another thing that she says later on when she's discussing the rights of women. She says, um, the true democratic principle is that no person's interests can be or can or can be ascertained to be identical with those of any other person. I mean, when she says that, she's answering the, the argument that uh, women don't need the franchise because their, their interests are, are represented by their husbands or fathers. Right, so I mean, it's not a very good argument, um, as she points out. Like none of the arguments that the the opponents of uh, women voting have to make seem like very good arguments, <laughs> um, but uh, but nevertheless, she's answering it. And among part of her answer is that the the true democratic principle is that no one's interests are the same as anyone else's. But if no one's interests are the same as everyone else's, um, uh, why can anyone's interests be represented by the government? And if they can't, then shouldn't we be saying that every individual has a right to independence and to separate? What is this thing about a people having a right to independence and to separate? Are there questions of what I said so far? I'm not sure whether it's not clear enough or too clear. <laughs> like I said the same thing too many times. Okay, no questions. So I'll go on. Um, 
So I think, you know, like Jefferson actually is, is trying to answer this question. And he's trying to answer it in the second paragraph of the declaration. So, um, um, and the way he tries to answer it is by appeal to political consent. Um, right, so the, the um, ability of a particular people to have um, rights, to have authority, um, is going to be due to the fact that all the individuals in it consent to it. Now, I mean, as I mentioned already in the first lecture, um, um, there may be fundamental problems with that. Like, how do I have a right to consent to the government to to, to consent to obeying the government if it's going to tell me to act against act against universal principles, right? Like how can I how can I promise that? Um, but maybe that's also not. Um, depending on how you think about universal principles, maybe not fatal. Um, so in any case, uh, uh, Jefferson is, is like trying to get there and he's following, he's taking a structure that basically comes from Locke. Um, but it's interesting to see what Jefferson tries to do with it and what kind of attack from Bentham that opens him up to. So, I mean, what he's trying to get at is why and how governments are instituted among men. Um, um, and by understanding how governments are instituted among men, he's going to also explain under what circumstances we therefore retain the right of, of rebellion against governments, right? So he wants to, so like the way out of this problem is going to be on the one hand to explain how a particular government can be legitimate, but on the other hand, to explain how, under what circumstances individuals can throw off that particular government and choose a different one. And, um, um, and again, the basic way he tries to do this has to do, is, is already found in Locke in the second treatise of government. Um, so actually, let me switch back to this. So we say, first of all, all men are created equal and are endowed, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So um, again, uh, this is an appeal to universal principles. Under the law of uh, nature or the law of reason or the, the natural divine law, um, um, everyone in principle has uh, the same rights the same unalienable rights. And so what is an unalienable, or I, I guess we would say inalienable right? Um, in fact, I when I, I often think of the declaration as saying inalienable, but it doesn't, it says unalienable, right? So um, unalienable means that we can't, we can't lay them down or transfer them. 
right? We can't alienate them. So like in general, if I have a right, um, like for example, the right to a certain piece of property, I can alienate it. I can give the property to someone else. I can sell it to someone else. Um, and under some legal systems, I can just abandon it. Uh, uh, under common law, you can't really abandon real property, but you can abandon movable property um, and like make it ownerless. But in any case, there's various ways I can alienate my right to that piece of property. But Locke is saying that there's certain unalienable rights. Maybe I should switch back to this one. There are unalienable rights. Um, and um, um, so these are rights such that any attempt to give them up or transfer them to someone else would be invalid. So um, like, uh, I think it's easiest to understand this based on the example in Hobbes. Um, so Hobbes like explains, for example, suppose I try to give up my right to life. What does that mean? Basically it means like, I promise not to resist you if you come to kill me. So I'm either just gonna like give that up on my own or I'm gonna sell it or something like that, right? Get, give it up in like uh, as trade for something else. So um, Hobbes says, if I say that, if I say, I hereby promise that if, that if you come to kill me, I won't resist, I can't be understood to mean it. Because like the promise is going to work by creating some motive, right? Never mind exactly what, but somehow it's going to give me a motive not to resist because I made the promise. That's, you know, I mean, uh, uh, otherwise the promise is no good, right? You have to know when you hear me say the promise that now I'm going to be motivated to fulfill the promise. Um, so uh, the promise somehow is going to create a motive for me not to resist when you come to kill me. But Hobbes says that motive could never outweigh my desire for self-preservation. That's what, that's what he claims. Maybe that's not true, but anyway, that's what Hobbes claims. So he says, right, that whatever motive the promise creates could never outweigh my desire for self-preservation. So um, I'm promising something that I literally can't deliver on. I'm promising not to resist you when you come to kill me. That is, I'm saying that I'm setting up a motive that will be strong enough to make me not resist you when you come to kill me, but there is no such motive. So it's as if I were promising to fly or something. <laughs> it's an invalid promise because I'm promising something that's beyond my power. Um, now, I mean, that's Hobbes, the way Locke and Jefferson understand it is maybe a little more complicated, but I think that's basically the gist of it for them too. An unalienable right is a right that I'm not able to give up. So if I say I'm giving it up, those are just empty words. So now, how can governments be instituted? Well, so in a state of nature, where everyone is the way they were created, there can be no government because the only rights that exist are these equal rights. A government will have to be instituted. How can a government be instituted? Well, um, and the answer is it can be if and only if it's instituted to secure those rights. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men.
without government in the state of nature, we are um, we have these rights, right? We were endowed with these rights by our creator. So even in the state of nature, we have these rights. Um, but the problem is in the state of nature, other people can violate these rights with no consequences. <laughs> Um, or without, I guess, without sufficiently clear consequences anyway. So we have the rights, but we're not secure in them. So that's how the law of reason authorizes us to institute a government. The law of reason says, these are the rights everyone has. But without instituting a government, those rights can't be protected. They can't be enjoyed. Therefore, the law of reason tells us to institute a government. And so, like, I mean, leaving aside here the question of laws that are going to be made later, right? Like a le the legislative faculty of the government that we've created. Um, uh, the initial agreement here, the initial social contract is that the government is going to um, act as an executive of the law of nature. There are these unalienable rights that we um, that we all have. We, we certainly don't we certainly can't create a government by giving them up because we can't give them up. We could, but we can create a government by agreeing to let the government enforce them. And that's basically, so this is a little bit different from Hobbes. It's basically Locke's understanding of um, how governments can be instituted. Right. And so, like, based on this explanation of how governments can be instituted, Locke and Jefferson conclude. If a government tries to violate those rights after we've instituted it, um, it's exceeding its authority because we uh, never consented to that. It wasn't instituted for that purpose, so we didn't give it that. Uh, we didn't give it a power that be, would go against the purpose for which it was instituted. Moreover, we couldn't have given it that power because, again, the rights are unalienable, right? So we can't um, give it give the government the power to violate them. So therefore, if the government does violate them, then we have no more duty to obey it at that point. And in, in principle, at that point, we can rebel. We must actually, well, and it is in principle, we must rebel at that point. However, uh, and this is why the, the second paragraph doesn't end here. Um, in practice, Locke says, and Jefferson is agreeing with him here, we need to balance um, the whatever damage the government is doing to our rights against the high potential cost of rebellion, right? I mean, rebellion, so like, it's always important to remember this, that rebellion or revolution, um, when it starts, it's not a revolution yet. Maybe I should say, maybe I should say revolution, right? Like, when it starts, it's not a revolution yet. It's just a civil war. <laughs> if you win it, maybe it will be a revolution, right? So, like, and civil war is pretty bad. Uh, Hobbes thinks it's worse than anything else that could happen. And so he thinks you never have a right to rebel. Locke doesn't go that far, but he has to admit that... Uh, um, a lot, the government could do a lot of bad things that would still not be as bad as starting a civil war. 
Um, so when there actually are violations of rights, we have to balance this out. We're not going to start a rebellion over every little thing. Um, but, and then this, pa uh, this passage here is virtually a paraphrase of what Locke says about this. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute, them meaning the subjects of the government, right? Evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. And then, of course, the rest of the declaration is um, supposed to, right, it's a long list of the ways George III and his parliament. I mean, even at this point in British history, I think it's already kind of more true that it's the parliament's fault than, than the king's, but they're, you know, they pin the blame on the king because it's his parliament. Um, anyway, be that as it may, um, the rest of the document is supposed to show that the conduct of George III and his parliament meets that criterion. It's involved a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, et cetera, right? So like when Locke says that, he's thinking about Charles II and James II and the indications that they're trying to establish an absolute monarchy and trying to return the nation to Catholicism. Um, and, you know, we have to stop them before they get all the way there. So but Jefferson is just taking over the same language and using it to describe George III. Okay, so, so that's what the answer is supposed to be. The answer is supposed to be, um, well, uh, first of all, it's true that universal principles don't directly legitimate any particular government, but they do legitimate the um, um, institution of governments in general because they, you know, involve everyone having certain rights, which can't be secured without creating a government. Um, now, I mean, uh, so far, that's not one government any more than any other, but then we bring in this principle that sometimes a government can act against the very principles it was instituted to secure. And in that case, at least if it's bad enough, if it's bad enough that it's worth it, then it becomes our right and our duty to throw off that government. And of course, then we're gonna to try to institute another government to secure our rights. Um, right, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. That's the new government they're setting up. Um, okay, are there questions about that so far? Okay, so like, um, a lot of Bentham's answers to the detailed charges right, to the list of charges against George III are kind of tricky. Um, like he kind of puts a weird spin on things to make them seem innocuous, right? Like for example, he says, I think, um, yeah, it was necessary to adjust the charters of one of these colonies because it was found not to consist with public order. And, uh, it, you know, it's well established that the king has that authority, the king and the, the parliament have that authority. Well, I mean, what actually happened was that the king completely suspended the charter of Massachusetts, 
appointed a new government governor and uh, um, uh, authorized the new government to appoint um, uh, to like appoint replacements for all the officers of, of the colony and a new legislator, le new legislature. <laughs> without elections, just would be appointed by the new government. So this isn't exactly like an adjustment of the charter, right? Um, this is, you know, and it was a military governor, right? So this is, this is you know, like um, suspending all rights in this colony and putting it under uh, an arbitrary military administration. <laughs> so like I'm saying this, like if you go through what Bentham says about the various charges and then read what the charge actually means, you'll see in a lot of places he's doing something tricky. Um, so, but, you know, I'm not so interested in those, but I am interested in what I take to be his general and main response which is that Jefferson and by extension Locke um, have proved too much. And I guess I should say that Bentham now at this point and later was always a, um, was a consistent opponent of social contract theory. He didn't think this was a good explanation for government. So, um, so he's definitely, he's attacking Jefferson and Locke. And what he says is that they prove too much. What do I mean by that? Well, um, oh, I see, right. So these pages that I wrote at the bottom, at the bottom are pages in, the complete packet of the readings if you like printed them all out and numbered them sequentially but you probably didn't do that so that might not help you um but anyway um the passage i'm going to read here is um so it's page 119 in bentham's pages So he says, you know, to these maxims, that is all these general principles that are cited in the declaration, adduced for this purpose, it would be sufficient to say that they are repugnant to the British constitution. Why would that be sufficient? Because again, Bentham doesn't accept like, like a, a basis in universal law, basically. I mean, it's weird because he's utilitarian and the way I've been arguing, it sounds like he would have to, but you have to get into the details of a system to understand. Anyway, um, but this is the important point. But beyond this, they are subversive of every actual or imaginable kind of government. It's not just the British constitution that these principles are subversive of. They're subversive of any actual or imaginable kind of government. Or as he says uh, a little bit later on, um, um, that the signers of the declaration, you know, uh, so I'm talking about Jefferson as the author of the declaration. And I think we all know that he wrote it, right? But like a bunch of people signed it. So in some sense, it's by all of them. So that's why like Bentham keeps saying what they say here, what they say, right. So um, so what he says later about them is, here then they have put the ax to the root of all governments, <laughs> right? In other words, what Bentham is saying is uh, what we've already seen indications of, a consistent application of Jefferson's principles implies anarchism. And again, by extension, therefore, he means a consistent application of Locke's principles implies anarchism. And, you know, I mean, we've already seen Edwards seeming to point in that direction. And soon enough, we'll see an actual anarchist saying, well, actually, we'll see a couple of actual anarchists, at least, saying, 
Yeah, that's right. If you understand the, the principles of the Declaration of Independence correctly, they, what they support is anarchism. Um, however, when Bentham makes this case, at first it kind of seems like he just doesn't get what Jefferson means. And not because he's stupid, presumably, um, I mean, he's not, <laughs> but but rather because he's like deliberately reading Jefferson in the most uncharitable way, right? So, I mean, the, the, the context here is that this is like a book that was not officially published by the British government, but encouraged to be published by the British government, answering the Declaration of Independence and um uh it was mostly written by a friend of bentham's uh but you know his name was lynch i think or something like that lynn now i'm forgetting i didn't write it down uh but um but anyway this the you know this guy asked bentham to to write the concluding chapter where he would like take up the broader theme of the declaration or the declaration as a whole um, so the context is like a political polemic, right? Like the idea is to like counter the the PR of the colonists with, you know, with our own response. So it's like not surprising to find Bentham interpreting Jefferson uncharitably. So for example, um, right away on his page 120. Oops. There we go. Um, Right, so Bentham says, you know, we're expecting them to produce the divine law, but what do they produce instead? What they call self-evident truths. All men, they tell us, are created equal. This surely is a new discovery. Now, for the first time, we learn that a child at the moment of his birth has the same quantity of natural power as the parent, the same quantity of political power as the magistrate. Right, so he's saying, like, uh, you guys say it's self-evident that all men are created equal and wow isn't that surprising so you're saying for example that uh, infants have the same power as adults but that's not true adults are much more powerful than infants <laughs> infants can't even hold their own head up so this supposed self-evident principle is just obviously false. Now, I mean, uh, of course, that's not what Jefferson means. Right, that's why I say it's uncharitable. Like, I mean, obviously that's not what Jefferson means. Obviously Jefferson knows as well as anyone that infants are not as powerful as adults. Um, and the other example that, um, um, that the infant has as much political power as the magistrate. Um, Jefferson doesn't mean that either. I mean, that would be anarchism or perhaps even worse than anarchism. I don't know what anarchists would say about infants, but right. I mean, it would be uh, um, saying that uh, there can't be an authoritative government because if, right, there's an officer, a magistrate, a judge, whatever, who's supposed to have the power to settle disputes, um, they don't have any more power than anyone else does, even infants, you know? So, like, uh, if I don't feel like doing what they say, I'll say, sorry, I have as much power as you do. That's obviously not what Jefferson means either. So what does he mean? Well, you know, I already said created equal means that everyone. Now, I mean, it can be a difficult question. Who's included in that everyone? 
I mean, all men, does it include women? Well, Martin New argues that it must, but Jefferson explicitly thought, and she quotes him <laughs> on this, that it that it doesn't, right? So, um, so, but anyway, leaving that aside for a second, created equal means that everyone um, uh, has the same rights in a state of nature. It means that everyone naturally has the same rights. They're created equal. So first of all, it doesn't mean they have equal natural power, that they're equally as strong as each other. It means they have the same rights. And it doesn't apply to children. Well, okay, so I should have said one other thing here. So, I mean, so uh, this is what I meant to say. I mean, according to Jefferson, maybe this doesn't include women. We're, we're like worried about this, but you know, if you look in Locke, it seems like everyone who's supposed to be referred to here is all rational beings. All rational beings, what does that mean? Uh, and why is it relevant? Um, it's not just because we like rational beings and we want to give them some extra rights. Um, it's because according to Locke, in order to have these rights, you have to understand the concept of a right, basically. Um, in particular, you have to be able to understand uh, that other people's rights should restrain you. So um, whatever beings are capable of that, whether they're men or women or rational parrots or whatever, um, is going to be included in this according to Locke. Um, but on the other hand, children who have not reached the age of reason are not included in it. Um, and uh, Locke says, actually, that's why they have to be under control of their parents. They have to be under control of their parents in order to grant them rights against everyone else, <laughs> right? So like the way it works is if the child is not under the control of anyone, then it's like, then the child is like a wild animal. Uh, I can't expect the child to respect my rights and therefore I'm not obligated to respect the child's rights. So, in, so we have to have a rational person who bring, ha, has the child under control and now they can guarantee that the child will respect my rights and that's how the child gets rights. Okay, so, um, so, so, so the point is like Locke, uh, Locke and therefore Jefferson don't think that this applies to infants. Um, and they don't think that it contradicts the magistrate's extra rights because um, the magistrate's extra rights are not rights that they were created with. They're rights that we granted the magistrate when we consented to form the government. That is, government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed, right, as Jefferson said. Um, so it might seem like Bentham doesn't really, is like deliberately just misunderstanding what Jefferson is saying in that attack. Or here's another one, although this one is a little bit trickier. So this is on page 122 of Bentham's pages. Um, here it is. Um, that, you know, so right before he's, ta he's talking about the right to pursuit of happiness, and he says, if it means anything, it means that people can pursue happiness however they want. And then he says, um, that is that all penal laws, those made by themselves among others, right? Meaning because the colonists have already made laws with punishments attached to them, that is penal laws. 
That is, that all penal laws, though made by themselves among others, which affect life or liberty, or are, cont are contrary to the law of God and the unalienable rights of mankind. That is, that thieves are not to be restrained from theft, murderers from murder, rebels from rebellion. <laughs> right? That is, he's like including them along with, he's including the colonists along with thieves and murderers. <laughs> He's saying that, and 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 that's the sense in which, as I said, they proved too much. They wanted to prove that under certain circumstances, rebels can't be punished for rebellion because they have rights. But he, Bentham is saying, but they proved too much because they proved that thieves can't be proved can't be punished for stealing and murderers can't be punished for murdering because they have an unalienable right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So however you, you uh, propose to punish them, even if it's just by a fine, right? Let alone a death penalty or locking them up or whatever, you're interfering with their unalienable right. Um, now, I mean, as I said, this is a little trickier. The justification of punishment actually um, is a little bit of a problem for classical liberal thinkers like Locke. Um, but roughly speaking, the reason you might think this is unfair is because the unalienable, unalienableness of a right means I can't give it up. It doesn't mean I can't forfeit it. Right. And at least Locke is very clear about this. So like so that is if if I start acting against the law of reason and violating other people's rights, then um, um, again, I'm like a wild animal. That's what he says. Right. They become like a wild beast. <laughs> um, they can't be trusted to respect rights and therefore they lose their rights. That's not the same as voluntarily giving it up, which is what he, you, which is what unalienable means that you can't do that. Okay, so all of that is why Bentham's attack might seem unfair, right? Bentham's attack, which again, this attack again would be a way of showing that Jefferson's principles lead to anarchy or anarchism. Um, because at least has seemed obvious to most political thinkers, whether it's really obvious, I don't know. It's not obvious to Thoreau or to Voltairine de Clare or to some of the other people we're gonna reading, but anyway, it seemed obvious to most political thinkers that you couldn't have an orderly society without punishments without threatened punishments, that is. I mean, in principle, maybe you could do the same thing by rewards. Some people try to explain why we don't use rewards as much as punishments. Um, in any case, so the point is, so from Bentham's point of view, this is like a reductio ad anarchism, <laughs> right? Saying that the, that they won't, the state won't be able to punish violations of laws. But again, it seems unfair because it's not really what Jefferson means by calling the rights unalienable. Um, but I think that if you look a little deeper, you can see that under the like kind of unfair treatment of Jefferson's language, there's a real serious criticism here. Um, because something important happened in that shift from Locke to Jefferson. So should I have said, I think in Bentham's mind, a good question. Maybe this is, I was wrong to say this, or maybe I just disagree with Bentham about this. 
Anyway, what I'm going to say is that Bentham has a serious criticism of Jefferson because the situation Jefferson is talking about is not really the same as the one Locke is talking about. Yeah, I guess, I mean, you could put it this way. Bentham is like... Um, deliberately taking Jefferson's and Locke's principles in a bad way to show that they lead to anarchism. And so the defense to, uh, against that would be, well, but Jefferson doesn't mean it that way. He means it the way Locke means it, and this is what it means. But the truth is that Jefferson isn't talking about the same situation that Locke is. Right? So Locke is not talking about the right of one people to rebel against another people. He's talking about the right of a people to rebel against its government. And again, the case he's thinking of, um, there's some question about, I guess, well, I don't know, I won't get into that, but the case he's thinking about either prospectively or retrospectively, depending exactly on which what time this part of the treatise was written, he's thinking about the revolution of 1688. So the revolution of 1688, you know, threw out James II and brought in William and Mary. And it didn't just switch from one monarch to another, but the, you know, before William and Mary were crowned, they had to agree to, um, uh, a, a bill of rights presented to them by the parliament. So they, so it was the first time that an English monarch like explicitly acknowledged that uh, England was a limited monarchy. So, so it was a rebellion against one government and a replacement of it with a, with a different government. Um, so therefore, Locke's case doesn't raise the question that Jefferson's case raises about what makes a people, right? I mean, Jefferson says that peoples are entitled to equal uh, equality and independence. Um, what counts as a people? So Locke's case doesn't raise that because in Locke's case, the people is defined relative to the existing government. There's already one government over all these people. Um, they've been governed up to now by this single government. And the question is, um, are they gonna get rid of it or and replace it or are they gonna keep it? How they got to be governed by a single government in the first place might be an interesting question, but it's not really relevant as far as the right of rebellion goes. Right? We don't know how this people came to be different from that people, and we don't have to know that to discuss Locke's case. But on the other hand, um, in Jefferson's case, that is in our case, right? The case of the United States, the people is claiming a right to separate from another people before they set up their own government, right? So there's two steps. The first step is one people is separating from another people. And the second step is now we're gonna set up our own government. Until this happened, there was no government that picked out that people. And in this context, um, what Bentham is saying, I think, takes on a different meaning. So, like, consider especially what he says. And this is uh, between the two quotes that I read before. So it's on page 121 in Bentham's pages. Um, up here. If the right of enjoying life be unalienable, whence came their invasion of his majesty's province of Canada? So, 
So in 1775, actually, before the declaration was even written, um, the American colonists had um, invaded Canada. Now, I mean, Canada at the time uh, basically meant Quebec, or Quebec, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, it didn't yet mean English Canada because there wasn't much of it yet, right? Like, um, I forget, I looked this up, but I didn't write it down when Toronto was actually founded. But um, although it may have existed at this time, it was very small. Montreal was much bigger than Toronto for a long time. So basically we're talking about uh, His Majesty's Province of Canada, we're talking about Quebec. Um, but nevertheless, you can already see something about that I talked about before about the relationship between the United States and Canada, <laughs> about the philosophical problems of Canada here. So Ray Bentham is saying, okay, um, everyone has an unalienable right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now you say, well, but governments are instituted among men to secure those. And then, of, and that's also underwritten by the law of nature. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, if you don't like obey the government, you're going against the law of nature. I mean, that is, except when there's a legitimate right of rebellion, right? But if you don't obey the government, then you're going against the law of nature and you forfeited your right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and you can be punished. But um, the Canadians, I mean, I don't know what good it's going to do for me to write this up there, but you know, you know, so here's the new people. That are separating themselves and are going to set up their own governments. And if you say, like, um, uh, well, how can you, how can your new government have a right to punish people? It's inconsistent with your maxims. They're going to say, Oh, well, but this is what our maxim means and gives the whole story from Locke. Um, and they're, they're going to explain how it's consistent with there being an unalienable right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But nevertheless, the new government they set up is going to be able to punish people. But what about the invasion of His Majesty's province of Canada? Um, Are these people here part of this new people or not? What's going to decide? Well, we're going to invade them, <laughs> right? Meaning we're going to deprive them of life, liberty, and, and happiness for their own good, maybe. <laughs> but we didn't establish that by getting their consent. And further down on the same page, he makes the same point about the loyalists within the colony. Uh, maybe it's not further down the same page. Where is this? No, it is here. I just didn't mark it. Uh, oops, but it was the wrong camera. I don't know. Um, if the right of enjoying liberty be unalienable, whence came so many of his majesty's peaceable subjects among them without any offense, without so much as a pretended offense, merely for being suspected not to wish well to their enormities, to be held by them in durance. Right, so what he's saying is, so forget Canada, 
which of course is what we usually do. We usually forget Canada. Um, it's kind of, uh, um, has the place of being in, in higher. It's always first and foremost, not disclosed. But anyway, okay, so forget Canada. Here, down here in the 13 colonies, there's some people who say, hey, no, I want to stay part of Britain. And they haven't done anything else wrong. They're not even suspected of doing anything else wrong. All they did was say, we're not going along with this rebellion. We're remaining loyal to Britain. And they've been put in prison by the colonists. How can that be justified? They're not, how are they part of this people? Why aren't they still part of the other people? <laughs> right, we had like, this was the old people. All the subjects of George III and his parliament. Now this new people is separating. But this person here says, I don't want to separate. So why aren't they still part of this? And if they are, your whole thing about consent of the governed is obviously not going to justify depriving them of their liberty. Like what principle of reason could justify that um, um, A and B get together and give their consent to some institution that's going to secure their rights. But meanwhile, they do that by killing or imprisoning C, who never consented to anything. <laughs> And I think, you know, uh, Bentham seems to have, from that point of view, there seems to be something to what he's saying. Um, um, if this principle, and I mean, I'm just getting back to something I said, you know, at the beginning of the class, I think, but I'm now hopefully getting back to it with, I don't know, from a better point of view or something. Um, if this principle really justifies the independence of people, of a, of a people, it does it only by justifying the independence of every single individual. <laughs> it doesn't give them any collective rights. And so therefore it's a principle of anarchism, right? It says, I mean, look, think, suppose it happened this way instead. Only this one person wants to separate, <laughs> right? So they write out a declaration saying, um, you know, the time has come for this people, meaning the people that contains only them, <laughs> to separate, um, you know, to dissolve the ties that have bound it to another, meaning everyone else. How is that any different from what Jefferson is doing? And of course, and see, I'm running low on time here, but okay, we're going to get to the important stuff, I think. Of course, as Bentham doesn't point out in, in this essay, but Martin New and Fuller both point this out, and Banneker and Apes also point this out. You don't have to go to Quebec to find people whose consent is not being obtained by these colonists. Um, and you don't have to uh, appeal to a few loyalists here and there. There's um, huge groups of people whose consent is not being asked for at all.
Um, now, um, Jefferson was definitely somewhat racist, at least he's very much so in the early 1780s when he wrote the notes on the state of Virginia. Um, I considered assigning some of that and actually among other reasons I, I decided not to assign it because it's kind of offensive and I didn't want to have to talk about it. So I mean it is fairly blatant. Um, in his response to Banneker he seems willing to reconsider that, right? You know he says, um, uh, oh I would really love to have it proved that uh, your race is not inferior to, to mine. In private, I, I think he still considered, continued to have more of his old opinions. Um, but um, in a way, and now we can see, I think the real hidden point in Bentham's question about all men are created equal, in a way that's irrelevant. In a way it's irrelevant because um, all men are created equal can't mean that all men have equal powers or all men and women have equal powers, right? It can't mean that they all have the same physical powers. It can't mean that they all have the same mental powers. It has to mean something else. Um, so like, even being racist, Jefferson doesn't have a justification for not getting these people's consent. Um, and uh, um, the same thing goes for, you know, and not getting their consent, to put it mildly, right? They're enslaved. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just that that no one asked them. <laughs> uh, um, and they're enslaved, among other people, by Jefferson. <laughs> right? So, like, um, uh, from that point of view, Bentham's question seems to be pretty good, actually. Now, for the first time, we learn that infants have the same natural power as their parents. And Jefferson, Jefferson wants to say, no, no, of course, I don't mean, uh, I, I mean that, I don't mean that all human beings have the same natural powers. I mean that all rational creatures have the same rights. Oh, yeah, uh, Jill said Native Americans also not asked. Yeah, and again, that's that's uh, the um, the point that William Apes is making in in his use of the Declaration. I mean, he's not quite as um, explicit about taking on the Declaration as some of these other authors are. I mean, point partly because his situation is different. He's trying to defend the rights of this particular tribe that have taken him in, right? He's not trying to make a grand political statement. But in any case, yeah, obviously Native Americans and Martin New emphasizes women, their consent hasn't been asked. That's half the people, right? And again, if Jefferson wants, to, if, if in response to Bentham, Jefferson wants to say, um uh no no what i meant is that all rational creatures have the same rights no matter what their powers um no matter whether they're you know humans or parrots or whatever so bentham and martin knew are going to say really you meant that well then what about <laughs> Right. So like so so like that defense is cut off. So in the end, Bentham like is not clearly being uncharitable to Jefferson. <laughs> the thing Jefferson would want to say in his defense, he can't consistently say. 
not consistent with his actions anyway. Um, okay, um, time is up. Uh, I guess I, I'll, I'll just say, um, um, that um, Fuller and Martin New, especially Martin New, seem to be optimistic that this problem can, that the problem can somehow be solved, that we can get all these people's consent, um, and that we can avoid invading other people like Mexico, at, you know, instead of Canada now, but it's the same problem, you know, we can, we, you know, uh, but it's not clear when you think about this example that Bentham's objection may be raising a problem that no reform could possibly solve. Um, and once again, we'll see that some people, including Thoreau, who we're going to read soon, basically bite that bullet and say, yes, Bentham, you're right. The correct application of this principle is that we shouldn't have government. <laughs> okay, um, I will see you next week. Thank you for coming. And good night. <laughs>